Okay. Um, well, I'll just start. Um, Fifteen minutes, as I see, go go by very quickly. Um, and it's always a somewhat daunting task to follow two colleagues who presented such coherent uh, papers. So I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so first of all, thanks to Philip uh, for organizing this event, for inviting me to be part of it. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here in this capacity uh, among so many distinguished mentors, colleagues, and indeed old friends. And I think um, leaving aside all the intellectual and professional contributions, which is, as you can hear, will occupy most of our time, I think it's also important to underscore um, the, uh, what this event says about the warmth and esteem with which colleagues hold Sally, the eagerness to come together uh, in this way from, from near and far. Um, and and I, I know this is not the, the first and is not the last of such events. Um, and just on that note, I would mention that if any of you here uh, are anthropologists and will be in Vancouver in two weeks, uh, Kamari Clark and I are organizing uh, an, an yet another event in honor of Sally um, as this year's winner of the Franz Boas Award for Exemplary Service to Anthropology, which is the highest and most distinguished award uh, uh, offered by the American Anthropological Association. Um, and the first winner of which in 1976 was Margaret Mead. Um, so, um, so let me start with an anecdote. Um, I, and, and, I, and I took Philip's um, uh, offer to not write a paper quite seriously, as you'll see. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the promise of the, of the chapter, which will be submitted by the end of, of, of March 2020. And I want to start with an anecdote. Um, a, a few years ago, there was a, a, a conference uh, organized at the University of Michigan Law School, at which Philip uh, Alston was also there. And this was a, a gathering of the sort of great and good of political philosophers of human rights, um, and uh, with some legal scholars mixed in, and little old me as the one anthropologist. Uh, and it was an interesting encounter, uh, an ethnographic encounter from uh, from my part as well, um, but. One of the things which I tried to do at this event was to resist the um, <coughs> insistence that I limit my contributions to the colorful ethnographic anecdotes that the, the political philosophers wanted me to provide so that they could then go on to do the real thinking about human rights. Um, and, uh, and it was precisely on the basis of one of Sally Mary's concepts, vernacularization, which I'll talk about, that I made these um, perhaps uh, often, uh, or at least on, a, on occasion, <coughs> unwanted contributions. Um, and so I'm very happy to have a chance to come and finally develop uh, this idea that I'm going to present, because I was never contacted again by the organizers of the conference. Uh, and so <laughs> this, this event will give me a chance to, to make this argument in, 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 a, in greater detail. So what I want to do is summarize the argument that I'm going to make in the, in the chapter and then sketch out how I'm going to develop it for, for the volume. So first, uh, just a bit of a refresher on the concept of vernacularization, which is just one among many of the, of the concepts that Sally is, is known for in her, in her distinguished academic career. And this concept is <clears throat> developed in several places, but two notable would be the 2006 American Anthropolog Anthropologist uh, article, Mapping the Middle, uh, which was a, 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 <clears throat> a collection uh, that sought to reframe the anthropology of human rights and, of course, her book, uh, Human Rights and Gender Violence. Um, and so I, what, what this idea of uh, uh, vernacularization does um, is it's based on research that Sally conducted between 1999 and 2004, uh, I would say maybe 2003, but into 2004, um, on the global efforts to reframe violence against women as a human rights violation. Now, Vernacularization is the empirical and theoretical category that Sally develops um, to explore the fraught mm. process of negotiation through which human rights ideas are put into practice. And what she, what she explores with this concept of, of vernacularization is a tension, a key tension, between local legitimacy or local cultural resonance in this process of translation and what we might think of as normative authenticity. And what she describes is this fine balancing act, which, which can't be, in a sense, theorized in, in a normative sense. It's something that has to be understood ethnographically in context. And I would say that for those of you who work with vernacularization, it's just something that happens with concepts that get, get you know, that, that, that themselves travel. 
is that this particular aspect of vernacularization, I think, all, often gets left out of the of the citations and the use of vernacularization, which gets, which which comes to be, you know, taken as just the process of translation. But in fact, if you go back and look at these sources, as I did to prepare for this talk, um, it's really this tension, this, this tension between maintaining a certain amount of local legitimacy, but also speaking to global or universal concerns. And some of those universal concerns are quite strategic because they get linked to, uh, they get linked to funding, they get linked to uh, NGO involvement. So, so, so this is, so this is the, the concept of vernacularization in, in, in kind of its pure sense. So what do I want to do with it? So what I want to do is um, kind of take this notion of vernacularization and in the good Festriff manner expand and, and adapt it um, uh, to, to apply it to a, to a slightly different kind of uh, argument. And, and that is that I think that vernacularization can be understood as a proposition uh, for a, uh, a project, a new way of understanding, a different way of understanding how human rights norms uh, are produced, which has quite radical implications for understanding, for, for the future of, uh, for the future of, uh, uh, of human rights. Um, and so what I want to say, what I want to suggest is that vernacularization um, can be used, extended to describe the many sites where human rights are, and more importantly should, be produced, challenged, reformed, and perhaps uh, even even uh, enforced. So, to develop the the explanatory value of this argument, um, I make reference to three case studies, not my own, but three scholars whose work has been directly influenced by the concept of vernacularization. And what I want to do is I want to show um, that this argument about vernacularization as a project for uh, reframing how we understand uh, human rights and indeed how human rights are produced is something that's already been present in the work of various ethnographers of, of human rights, if perhaps not uh, so directly. Um, and so very briefly, the three work scholars whose work I, I'm going to be engaging with or developing is Shannon Speed's work on the uh, juntas de buen gobierno in the, among the Zap, uh, during the Zapatista um, rebellion uh, against the Mexican state, um, which was the f sort of an order of chronology. Sarah Holcomb's more recent work on her efforts to work with a team to translate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the first time into an indigenous Australian language. And then finally, Lynette Shue's fascinating um, study <coughs> of the place of human rights and the vernacularization process that take place among LGBT activism in Myanmar. So each of these studies contributes something uh, different to this effort to think of vernacularization in a more expansive way as a project to reimagine the grounds of human rights. So uh, just a few, just briefly on each, on, on, on each of these three case studies. So in the case of uh, Shannon Speed, um, she conducted research in this um, difficult period of Mexican history in which um, uh, indigenous uh, Zapatista um, communities were being influenced by uh, transnational NGOs to adopt human rights as the framework for resistance against the Mexican state in order to replace the more conventional revolutionary Marxist framework which suggested violence and which had different kinds of diff different kinds of consequences. Um, and what she shows uh, in her research, and which I'm going to be developing and, and working with in my, in my contribution, is how even very deeply vernacularized uh, human rights. Now, if you know her work, you, you, you know how she shows how, in a sense, the, the Zapatistas pushed the boundaries of vernacularization <coughs> beyond what many human rights theorists and activists would recognize as human rights. And this is going to be sort of, one of my point is that we need to sort of let go of that line about what we should be taking as human rights and not. But she shows how human rights can play an, an important role as a form of uh, potentia, that is the good kind of power in the Spinozan sense, um, the kind of power that on occasion can be mobilized against the many forms through which sovereign violence is expressed uh, through political economy, <laughs> law, and social organization. So in these three different categories, I'm going to be taking um, Shannon Speed as, uh, as an example of the way in which vernacularization reinforces the, 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 the extent to which human rights can, can constitute a, a, a form of good power, as it were. Um, 
Now, Sarah Holcomb's research, um, which by a wonderful co coincidence was profoundly shaped by Fred Meyer's writings on various questions of Ayangu? Anangu. Anangu. On the go ethno, ethno epistemology, and I, I've been practicing that word, and as you can see, I, I, failed, I failed miserably. Um, uh, because it's not pronounced exactly as, as it's written, but um, revolves around the project to translate the UDHR into uh, an Aboriginal language for the first time. Um, now, what her studies suggest is that the, que that the quest for normative commensurability the idea of trying to find uh, rough equivalents for normative concepts was itself misplaced. Instead, in a way that evokes the work on uh, diatopical hermeneutics by the Indo-Catalan philosopher Raymond Panikar, um, she argues that vernacularization be sh should be seen as a space in which the encounters between different cognitive and moral worlds can be negotiated yet always in relation to particular histories of domination, resistance, and social suffering. And here is, I don't have time to develop it, but the, the difference between topos and logos will be important for this second category of, uh, the second category of developing vernacularization. Um, now, the third um, case study that I'm going to be developing is, as I mentioned, Lynette Shua's um, more recent work on LGBT activists in, in Myanmar. Uh, and this adds a dimension uh, to this to this project, to this proposal, that, that speaks to the question of empowerment. How is it that, this, that vernacularized human rights can become a form of empowerment for individuals and collectivities? And I think her research provides an extraordinary uh, case study for thinking through this, through this problem. And she conducted ethnographic research in a very, very difficult, uh, very, very difficult circumstances in um, Burmese history. So this was a time in which Aung San Suu Kyi <coughs> Uh, had returned to Myanmar, uh, and there was a, a sense of opening uh, to uh, various kinds of international and transnational uh, developments. Uh, researchers could, could go back to Myanmar. Um, and it was also difficult in a, what we might call a cultural sense. So as she describes it, there was a, um, a, a, a somewhat insidious uh, combination of uh, what she calls Burmese karmic logic um, patriarchal social hierarchy and state suppression, which created um, a tr what she calls a triple vulnerability for the Burmese uh, LGB uh, community. And so her research is tracking the way in which uh, these very hidden um, activists created an embryonic LGBT movement in Myanmar precisely on the basis of uh, their embrace of human rights in the vernacular. Uh, and so this was not a mobilization against the Burmese state. This was not one which was leading, for, leading to um, radical change, but it was one which, which really uh, changed how people saw themselves and how they lived as, as queer uh, Burmese. Uh, and so she, 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 in a sense, gives us a case, an extraordinary case study for thinking through these very outer margins where human rights remain important as a sense, as, as, a, as a mechanism for, for empowerment. Um, and she, what I want to say here is that her account teaches us that the mobilization of human rights in the vernacular in this expansive sense can be radical, uh, but not necessarily revolutionary. Um, that human rights can become a framework um, through which individual and collective empowerment is expressed and as important experienced. And in her, in her account, she focuses she focuses at length on the, what, what we might think of as the phenomenological dimensions of empowerment, as opposed to their institutional, uh, as opposed to their institutional or even social social dimensions. And she carves out a um, a space for this phenomenological dimension as an important way of understanding the potential for vernacularized uh, human rights. And as she puts it, uh, this is at the end of her study: out of human rights, LGBT activists in Myanmar fashioned a way of living more uh, authentically as queer people. Okay, so after developing this through these various case studies, um, the, the notion of, of vernacularization as a, as a new, as a project for regrounding uh, human rights um, uh, that is expansive and indeed um, subversive, uh, in relation to orthodox understandings. Um, I then step back in the chapter, I will be stepping back in the chapter, and um, using this 
concept of vernacularization to consider debates that are, not, that are now raging about the future of human rights. And so many of you who are human rights scholars know those kind of debates that I'm uh, referring to. Um, and instead of the, the do they work or don't they work angle, which tends to occupy a part of this, um, this, these debates, or the question of ongoing global legitimacy, what I'm going to argue is that vernacularization offers a quite different response to the question of the future of human rights, which is to show how human rights might be reframed or regrounded as a translocal, though not universal, logic that harnesses human rights potential for power and potentia in the Spinozan sense, this diatopical understanding, which is an encounter between different cognitive and moral worlds, and uh, empowerment. So finally, uh, why do I describe this account of vernacularization uh, as an anthropological ethics? Um, and this brings me back to the University of Michigan conference and perhaps explains why I was never uh, contacted again. And that is, I, th I think to privilege the practice of human rights, uh, as Sally has done uh, in her work, um, and to uh, insist on the practice of human rights uh, as a fundamental basis for understanding human rights, for what they can be, what they are, their limitations, um, is also to make an ethical <coughs> claim about the importance of decolonizing human rights through cultural pluralism and normative contingency, which also carries implications for the sites uh, and the people who inhabit those sites where dominant ideas uh, about human rights have traditionally been produced and debated.